Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first ever National Lab Research Slam. All 17 national laboratories of the US Department of Energy have each sent one champion. An early career researcher who typically already won a local slam and is here today to share with you the highlights of his or her research in under three minutes. I imagine most of you love research for a variety of reasons. Myself, I find that research brings people together. It always has. And the United States, in particular, have always managed to attract bright young talent from all over the world. Out of 17 finalists, eight are US citizens. The remaining nine have a different nationality and a different native language. We have Espanol, Francais, Deutsch, Bangla, Hiligaynon, Hangugo, I'm going to say it correctly, Zhongwen, and the most difficult of them all, British English. <laughs> Even your master of ceremonies tonight has got a supposedly charming but clearly non-native accent in English. I am Jean-Luc Dumont and soon after my own PhD, I decided to devote my life to training researchers in giving presentations, writing papers, creating posters and much more. It was my privilege to work with all 17 finalists on their three-minute presentation for today, and now it is going to be my pleasure to introduce them to you. But first, before we do that, please join me in thanking both the House National Labs Caucus and the Senate National Lab Caucus for hosting us today. It is also my pleasure to introduce co-chairs of those important groups of members of Congress who are working to promote the critical research taking place in the national labs of the Department of Energy. First of all, Congressman Chuck Fleischmann, who represents the 3rd Congressional District of Tennessee. In the 118th Congress, he serves as chairman of the House Energy and Water Appropriations Subcommittee, where he conducts efforts to fund the federal programs and agencies responsible for the national labs, energy independence, and nuclear security. His district is home to Oak Ridge National Laboratory Ladies and gentlemen, Chairman Fleischmann. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I was waiting to hear those two very special words, Oak Ridge. Uh, I was with my friend Ernie Moniz today and, and uh, also Secretary DeBar in a Fusion Caucus event. and. Uh, we were talking about things and Ernie said, okay, Chuck, you're gonna talk about Oak Ridge. And I love Oak Ridge. Uh, it is a wonderful, wonderful uh, reservation. ORNL is near and dear to my heart. But with sincerity, as chairman, I can say this, I love all of our 17 national labs. It has been a contentious week here. It has been a contentious set of weeks here, uh, which culminate into contentious months and difficult times. But yesterday, I had a very special opportunity to meet with all of the contestants. And it was interesting. Here I was, 
um, a Republican congressman from East Tennessee in a room with wonderful young minds from literally all the national labs. And we had a great conversation. We didn't have a conversation about politics. We had a conversation about what they were doing at their national lab and what they were going to do in the future. I could not be more proud of our young people. So thank you to everyone who is doing this, our judges, uh, all of our national labs, to support these great young people in their endeavors. I'm going to close by saying this. We're in very difficult, contentious times. It's polarized and the like. Uh, my dear friend, uh, Senator Ben Ray Lujan from New Mexico, he served with me in the House. We have worked together, collaborated for years on nuclear cleanup, on our national labs. Uh, I could not be more pleased of the Department of Energy. I've worked with three administrations now. I see Director Ruby here. Thank you for the NNSA. Thank you for all you do. It's a big part of our work uh, at our national labs and, and for our country. In closing, I want to say thank you. Uh, let us honor these great participants. There's going to be winners and losers, but they are all great. Let's encourage them all because tomorrow uh, they're going to be doing great things into the future. So it's my privilege to fund that, but let's all stand behind them. Thanks to each and every one of you for what you do. And yes, if you're ever in Oak Ridge, give us a call. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Ben Ray Lujan has represented New Mexico in the US Senate since 2021. He previously represented the New Mexico 3rd Congressional District in the House, where he served as Assistant Speaker in the 116th Congress. Before running for Congress, he was the chairman of the New Mexico Public Regulation Commission, where he was no stranger to energy issues. He represents two national labs, and as we've just heard, yes, he has been a champion of science and technology research throughout his time in Congress. Welcome, Senator. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It, it's, it's great to see you all. Um, to all the judges, my deepest gratitude for making yourselves available, um, for caring, for making a difference, um, no matter where life takes you to, to be here today. Um, I, like Chuck, had the honor of visiting with all of our contestants, our participants uh, yesterday um, to, to learn about the incredible work that um, few friends from New Mexico. I, I don't want to um, impress upon the judges about the work that Rebecca and Megan <laughs> do. Um, uh, Jill, you know where I'm coming from. And, and Mr. Chairman, can we thank Chuck Fleischman one more time, please? Because the, the work of Chairman Fleischman has really been incredible in the space of advocacy for our national labs. Um, being instrumental in not just expanding the National Lab Caucus, but in being able to deliver legislative accomplishments, budget expansion, support. Um, it's quite incredible. The only thing I will disagree with Chairman Fleischman is Ernie Moniz's love of Los Alamos. Um, and so we might have to have a conversation about that. But in the end, the work that has been done, the discovery, the innovation, the support, um, it's quite incredible that this is the first time that all of the national labs are getting together to be able to support such an initiative with the SLAM. This should be the first annual, and we need to keep coming to the second, third, fourth, and fifth. And by the way, we should have a conversation, Jill, with the secretary and to the undersecretary about including a provision in the contracts that won't make you get paid in full unless you are investing in this program. So there's one way or another. I see a lot of eyes getting larger out there as well, um, especially with our lab directors. Um, there's one way or another that we can continue this, but this is quite exemplary. This really is an example of one part of the national labs that does not receive the attention that it should. When we have conversations about national security, the work that you are doing somewhere in the world, when there's something bad happening, to understand what's happened, why it's happened, and to keep it from happening again. When something exemplary is happening somewhere in the world, someone from one of our national labs is there, responsible for that great activity. 
we don't talk about the economic impact and upside and benefits from our national labs in addition to national security enough. This is just one of those examples. So congratulations, it's an honor to be here. Count on my continued support for the Department of Energy, for our national labs, specifically three administrator, for the work that we'll do with the NSA facilities as well. But kudos and congratulations to each and every one of you. The best of luck to our contestants, especially Megan and Rebecca. Thank you, Senator. 17 national laboratories, 17 finalists spread over four different categories. One award per category attributed by a sample of N equals four judges, the way we would put it scientifically, which I will be happy to introduce. First of all, the Deputy Secretary of obviously the U.S. Department of Energy, the Honorable Mr. David Turk. Would you please do? There we go. Next, the 14th President of the National Science Foundation, the Honorable Dr. Franz Cordova. Third, the President of the National Academy of Sciences, Dr. Marcia McNutt. And finally, the Deputy Director of National Security for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, Mr. Steve Welby. Any statistical mind in the audience will have figured out already that if you want to win an award today, it pays to be in national security because the odds of winning are significantly higher. But fear not, we also have a much more democratic award, one that will be selected by our audience. And that means you in the Congressional Auditorium right here, right now, but also our remote audience, yes, you will take a part in that. And for all five awards, the criteria are the same. Structure, slide, delivery. Structure first. Does the story make you care? Does it clarify the contribution of the researcher? Does it convey a message? Slide, does it help clarify visually this message? Or does it, heaven forbid, distract from what the speaker is saying? And delivery, do the words, the voice, and the body language contribute to engaging the audience? In a nutshell, did you get it clearly, effortlessly, pleasantly? Now, I will be sharing a QR code at the end for the People's Choice Award. You can then scan it to access the ballot. But in the meantime, how about you use your smartphones to take pictures and to share them broadly on social media with the hashtags NL Slam, NL Research Slam, and National Lab Slam. Please memorize those three hashtags quickly because this slide will self destruct in five seconds. Just time for me to introduce the first category, which is tum, ta, ta, tum, scientific discovery, fundamental scientific discovery in the DOE national labs, drives scientific breakthroughs, addresses big questions, and expands what is possible to achieve through human ingenuity. And that research, that scientific discovery is taking place, among others, at those gigantic crash test sites that are called National Accelerator Facilities, but also at Los Alamos National Lab and Brookhaven National Lab. Let's hear it for all five of those national labs through this video.
Hello, this is Congressman Bobby Scott, proudly representing Virginia's 3rd District, wishing the best of luck to Pierre Chatagnon from Jefferson Lab. Hi, I'm Congresswoman Anna Eshoo, so proud to represent California's 16th District and wishing Taryn Driver all the best of luck from Stanford Linear Accelerator. Hi, this is Congresswoman Delia Ramirez. I proudly represent Illinois 3rd Congressional District. I'm excited to join you today to wish you the best of luck to you, my constituent, Stefan Nurk from Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory. Stefan, thank you for representing our vibrant, diverse community with such pride. Congratulations on being nominated and good luck. Buenas tardes. I'm Congresswoman Teresa Ledger Fernandez, serving the beautiful and beautifully diverse 3rd Congressional District of Nuevo Mexico. Today, it gives me great joy to introduce Dr. Teresa Kuzinski from our very own Los Alamos National Lab. Dr. Kuzinski is part of the lab's microscopy team, materials, science, and technology division. Her research in electron microscopy explores new methods to capture images of atmospheric aerosol particles. She studies imperfect materials to improve our knowledge and our technology. Dr. Kaczynski, thank you for the work you do helping us understand imperfection and the benefits it can bring. Let me know how we can apply that to understand the imperfect but endearing human beings that we are. Best of luck to you, our New Mexico champion. Hey there, it's Congressman Nick Lalota. I'm proud to represent New York's first congressional district, home to the one and only Brookhaven National Lab and Electron Ion Collider. I want to wish the best of luck to BNL's own Daniel Marks as he competes in the Department of Energy's National Lab Research Slam right here, our nation's capital. It's been so great to work with the incredible team at BNL and learn all about the amazing work they are doing. I know Daniel will make Suffolk County proud, and I wish him nothing but the best at this year's competition and in all of his future endeavors. Thanks so much, and God bless. Our first speaker and I share a common native language, but not a common nationality. He's from France, I'm from Belgium. So I'm supposed to hate his guts. <laughs> Not just because food is always nicer on the other side of the border, but also because this gentleman right here can solve the Rubik's Cube in less than 30 seconds, something that I have been unable to do since the 1980s. Man, I'm feeling old. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, or should I say, mesdames et messieurs, from Thomas Jefferson National Accelerator Facility, le Dr. Pierre Chatagnon. You, me, the air we breathe, all of us, and actually everything around us, is made of three building blocks, electrons, protons, and neutrons. The protons and neutrons are especially interesting because they are themselves made of very fundamental particles, which we call the quarks. What binds the quark together in the proton is the strong force, one of the four fundamental forces in the universe. And, as its name suggests, the strong force is strong. But how strong exactly? To get a feeling about it, let's take a very simple example, the pressure. The concept of pressure quantifies how much force is applied on a given area. For example, a diver 10 meters below water would experience a pressure that corresponds to roughly 30 pounds per every inch square. At the center of the Earth, the pressure is much larger. It corresponds to roughly five times the weight of the US Capitol Dome applied on every inch square. And finally, at the core of a neutron star, one of the densest bodies in the universe, the pressure is so crushing that it was actually difficult to find an example to compare to. It corresponds to roughly five times the weight of the sun per every inch square. If we were to put our imaginary pressure gauge inside a proton, what pressure would we measure? For very long, this question had no experimental answer, 
because of the very, very small mass of the proton. But by now, I'm sure you are all, like me, very eager to know what is the pressure in each and every of the three billions of billions of billions of protons that are in your body, right? Fortunately for us, the key to this stalemate was given by theoricians that related not only the pressure, but also a lot of fundamental properties of the proton to experiments where an electron scatters off a proton. At Jefferson Lab, we have a high energy electron beams that is delivered to four experimental holes where large experiments like the one I'm working on are able to detect all the particles that are emitted when an electron smashes into a proton. And so, using the results of these experiments, I can tell you that the pressure inside the proton is roughly equivalent to... Wait, no, it's not so simple. This experiment produces more than 500 megabytes of data every single second. At this rate, the memory of your laptop would be completely full in less than half an hour. My role here is to design and write the code that will be able, from this huge amount of data, to retrieve the very fundamental properties of the proton, which are absolutely, un which are absolutely necessary to our understanding of nature. And there you have it. For the first time, scientists at Jefferson Lab have been able to measure directly the pressure inside the proton. And it turns out that it's 10 times larger than the pressure inside the neutron star. Really, as its name suggests, the strong force is very, very strong. And may the strong force be with you. You know, researchers are talented people in so many different ways. As a nine-year-old fan, our next speaker sent in a letter and was accepted to audition for the role of Harry Potter in the movie franchise. As you already know, he did not get the part. <laughs> but give him an X-ray laser and this muggle right here can do research that is indistinguishable from magic. From Slack National Accelerator Facility, Dr. Taryn Driver. So, perhaps you're wondering what these silky dance moves could possibly have to do with science. Well, we'll come back to disco. But to explain, first I'd like to take you back down to the subatomic world of protons and neutrons, and our quest to understand the most influential particle of all, the electron. Electrons are the tiny charged particles that hold together atoms to form matter. And the story of our biggest technical developments of the past two centuries is the story of how we began to make use of the electron's phenomenal power. When we learned to release the energy with which electrons bind together sticky fossil fuels, it drove the Industrial Revolution. And when we figured we could make them carry information, we built the information technology that permeates every aspect of our lives. And as we learn more about the electron, we've conceived of powerful new advances, such as next-generation catalysts and microchips. But there's still so much more we can do. The problem is, incredibly, we still don't understand how electrons move. This is because they move so fast that it's almost impossible to see what they're doing. For example, the time it takes an electron to cross a chemical bond is about 100 attoseconds. If I could take a step every 100 attoseconds, then in one blink of your eye, I could run to the sun and back about 3,000 times. And if the word attosecond sounds familiar, it might be because a few weeks ago, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to the first scientist to generate attosecond pulses of light. And hopefully now you'll see why this was such a big deal. Because to take a picture of something moving quick, you'd like a fast shutter speed. But the fastest camera shutter is about a trillion times too slow to capture a moving electron. Attosecond pulses enable researchers like me to take pictures of moving electrons by instead keeping the shutter open all the time 
And, just like a strobe light at a disco, freeze electrons in motion by flashing them with ultra-short pulses. And I'm lucky, because the attosecond pulses I use are made at the X-ray laser at Slack National Lab. And they're the brightest attosecond pulses in the world by a factor of about one million. And they've already enabled me to take the sharpest, brightest pictures of an electron boogieing across a small molecule. And my hope is that further experiments on new molecules will help power us into the future. Because from new clean energy technology to quantum computing, a key to understanding how to power us into the future will be an intricate knowledge of just how electrons dance. Thank you, Taryn. And for you here, if anyone ever asks you what is the one thing you could not possibly live without, now you know that the answer should be the electron. Right. Speaking of attracting international researchers, our next speaker is from Germany. His wife is from Japan. So their daughter, bought in, uh, born in Europe, has got double nationality. That's when they thought, how can we top that? Well, by moving to the United States, of course. Their son, born in the US, has got triple nationality. Oh, by the way, for any biologist in the room or out there watching us remotely, action here in the title is not a typo for the long tail of a nerve cell, okay? We really mean action. Meine Damen und Herren, from Fermi National Accelerator Facility, Herr Dr. Stefan Knirk. Dark Matter. Who in this room knows what Dark Matter is? Whoa. <laughs> well, even scientists don't know what dark matter is. That's what science is about. It's not about the things we know. It's about the things we don't know yet. Now, what I know is dark matter is all around us, even here tonight in this room, constantly flying through us. Don't you want to know what that stuff is? Well, it could be a new fundamental particle called the axion. And this is what it can do. If you give it a magnetic field, it can convert to particles of light. Now, I'm an experimentalist, so I dare you to join me in this experiment tonight. We have a magnet. The Earth has a magnetic field. And you all have very sensitive light detectors your own eyes. Of course, there's lots of background light around, so I want you to firmly shut your eyes and cover them with your hands. Can you all do this? Whoa, that's great. I see lots of dark matter detectors around. Now, look for a signal of light. Okay, you can open your eyes again. Did anyone see a signal of light? Do we have evidence for axion dark matter? No? Well, okay, maybe you think this was crazy, right? Of course I'm going to see nothing. Well, how many of you are actually absolutely sure they saw absolutely nothing? We did just this experiment, essentially this experiment, this summer in our lab with fantastic students. Of course, not with our eyes, but with cheap off-the-shelf radio detectors. And this experiment was about 10,000 times more sensitive to a similar type of dark matter signal than what had ever been done before. Now just imagine what we will be doing when in the next step we combine this with really powerful magnets and sensors so sensitive they can see single quanta of light. Now if you vote for me tonight, you will be voting for what science is really about. It's about the things we don't know yet. 
but also the unconventional, crazy things we do every day at labs like Fermilab to find out. Thank you, Stefan. And when you figure out what dark matter is, do let us know, of course. Our next speaker wanted to take her research to new heights. So she moved to Los Alamos, which, as many of you know, is located more than 7,000 feet above sea level. But that was not good enough for her. In the nearby state of Colorado, she's already been hiking and climbing eight 14ers, eight summits of 14,000 feet, or put in scientific units, 4,267 meters and 200 millimeters to be precise. Ladies and gentlemen, from Los Alamos National Laboratory, Dr. Teresa Kaczynski. I bet almost everyone here is like me. And we can all have those days where we feel the pressure to be perfect. It doesn't just stop with our own expectations. Sometimes scientists transfer this ideal to materials too. But do we really need perfect materials to get the job done right? Life is complicated. And embracing so-called imperfections can create a vibrant and unique world. So why wouldn't the same be true for our materials? In the past, we assumed that imperfections were like bugs that needed to be fixed. But when we take the time to understand and embrace imperfections, we can transform them from bugs into features. For example, purposefully creating imperfections in concrete can make it stronger by locking layers in place. Or in lithium ion batteries, where imperfections in the form of missing atoms can enhance performance. But that still leaves the question, how do we know what certain imperfections can do? Well, first, we need to be able to see the imperfections to see how they're impacting the behavior of materials. One way to look at imperfections is by taking images of atoms with extremely powerful electron microscopes. But even really powerful microscopes don't give us the complete picture. We get blurry shapes and limited details about the imperfections the equivalent of a Lego Mona Lisa. Initially, we tried to improve the resolution by obtaining large amounts of data, but this is too much. Our files were so large that they crashed our computers and made it hard to see the details that we wanted, the imperfections. The effect, like looking at a blurry Mona Lisa, not great. The problem with so much data is that we begin to lose sight of the details needed to see the imperfections. But not unless we have a way to analyze all of it, which I do. So this is where my job comes in. My research instructs computers to automatically sort through those ginormous amounts of data to better prioritize the information that I care about, the imperfections. This lets me balance the fine details with the big picture. And now we can perfectly see those imperfections and we achieve the full Mona Lisa. With this level of clarity, it becomes easy to see the imperfections. And what's better is that we can expose the materials to things like heat and stress so that we can see how the imperfections are working in real time. By being able to precisely identify imperfections, we can connect them to all sorts of unique and beneficial behaviors. And ultimately, we can use them to advance our technology from wearable tech to more accessible renewable energy. As my research shows, embracing imperfections opens up a whole world of possibilities. Nobody's perfect. And our materials, well, they don't have to be either. Thank you, Theresa. This is to all the imperfectly perfect people in the audience today. Now, you probably know that many famous researchers were accomplished musicians. 
Albert, Albert Einstein was a violin player, Richard Feynman was a drummer, and our next speaker is an organ player. Just last month, he played the church organ at his sister's wedding in Italy. Ladies and gentlemen, from Brookhaven National Laboratory, Dr. Daniel Marx. Have you ever stood on a scale and wondered where all those pounds came from? Virtually all the mass in our bodies and objects around us is due to the protons and neutrons that form an atom's nucleus. Inside these protons and neutrons are fundamental particles called quarks and gluons. But curiously, if you add up their masses, you only get about 1% of the total mass. The rest must somehow come from the interactions between them in the nucleus. But how exactly does this happen? This is just one of the mysteries of the atomic nucleus we still need to solve in order to truly understand these building blocks of matter. I'm part of the team designing a new machine to do just this, the Electron-Ion Collider, the EIC, which will be built in a 2.4-mile circular tunnel at Brookhaven National Lab. By colliding electrons with protons or ions, which are just charged atoms, we'll be able to scan the structure of the nucleus and produce 3D images of the dynamic soup of quarks and gluons inside. The EIC will be a highly complex and unique collider. For a start, electrons and ions have vastly different masses, and they need to be accelerated in separate beamlines. In fact, we've got to build two rings just for the electrons, a booster to accelerate them, and another ring for colliding them. Each ring will contain many hundreds of magnets. Some of them bend the beam around the ring, others focus it, and many more correct for errors and unwanted effects. My work involves arranging all these magnets around the ring and setting their strengths so that we can control the beam position and size to less than the width of a human hair. It's particularly challenging because the EIC will collide beams with a wide range of energies, and the design needs to be flexible enough to support this. And somehow we've got to do all this while squeezing four rings into a tunnel about the width of an airplane cabin. We've been working hard on this challenge for many years, and I'm excited that we now have a promising design that meets our requirements. In a decade from now, we'll be sitting in the control room, watching the first collisions. They will allow us to unlock the secrets of the atomic nucleus, so that one day, when we stand on a scale, we won't just blame the nucleus for the number we see, will actually understand it. Thank you, Daniel. You just have to love those TLAs, right? The three letter acronyms like you have in this title here. Now, the DOE National Labs do much more than just scientific discovery. They play a crucial role in maintaining the US national security and world geopolitical stability by providing the expertise required to ensure the safety, security, and reliability of this nation's nuclear deterrent and by addressing emerging threats in for example, nuclear non-proliferation, biostability, energy, security, intelligence, many more. And this research takes place, among others, at Sandia, Argonne, and Lawrence Livermore National Labs. So, once again, let's hear some words of encouragement for our next three speakers through the video.
Hey everyone, this is Congresswoman Melanie Stansbury and I wanna wish the best of luck to Megan Dahlhauser of Sandia National Laboratories. Good luck. Hi, this is Congressman Bill Foster representing 100% of the Strategic Reserve of PhD physicists in the United States Congress, as well as the Illinois 11th District and Argonne National Laboratory. And I'd like to congratulate Liz Laudadio and wish them the best of luck on their presentation. Hello, this is Congressman Eric Swalwell, proudly representing California's 14th District, and I want to wish the best of luck to Dr. Brandon Zimmerman from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. No. I keep meeting people who believe that researchers are necessarily physically inept. They use their brains, but never their bodies. Well, nothing could be further from the truth, with a few exceptions, admittedly. But our next speaker has been a ballet dancer for a good 15 years, and even a ballet teacher. How is that for body coordination? From Sandia National Laboratories, Dr. Megan Dalhauser. Have any of you experienced a computer failure before? <laughs> if this screen elicited a visceral response, I'm so sorry. <laughs> this is one kind of computer failure known as the dreaded blue screen of death. But computers can fail in other ways too. Today, our very best supercomputers fail to solve some really important problems. They fail to communicate securely. They fail to prevent certain kinds of attacks. They fail to simulate quantum systems and more. When computers give us the blue screen of death, we restart them. But when our best computers fail to solve some really valuable problems, we develop a fundamentally different kind of computer. Enter quantum computers. Quantum computers utilize the principles of quantum physics to open a whole new world of possibilities beyond anything we can do with modern computers. We expect that a fully realized quantum computer will be able to create ultra-secure communications, protect our current computing resources, uh, rapidly accelerate drug discovery, find cures for diseases, and so much more. So how do we get to a fully realized quantum computer. In the 1940s and 50s, young inventors built small experimental versions of computers, and sometimes in their garages, but they failed thousands of times, and even still, they learned from every failure and kept persisting. At Sandia, we have a pretty fancy version of a garage, but we're at the same small-scale testing stage, which means that our quantum computers right now are experiencing a lot of failures. The real challenge is that when quantum computers fail, we can't just restart them. Because what I've learned in my work is that quantum computers fail in ways we don't understand yet. My team at Sandia are experts in testing quantum computer performance. We've developed tools that determine exactly how much we can trust our understanding of quantum failures. For instance, I can find the exact point in a quantum computer program where our expectations deviate from actual performance. With the tools we've developed, we can figure out which programs will work, which ones won't, and most importantly, why. It means that every time a quantum computer fails, we learn more about quantum computers and we learn more about fundamental quantum physics. When quantum computers fail, we are able to make that part of the solution. Thank you, Megan. And let's hope that will be the only time this afternoon that we see the blue screen of death. Talk about a talented cast today. Our next speaker did three years of improv comedy 
in high school. And even though the title of their talk sounds like the perfect improv topic, let me assure you, nothing today is improvised. As Mark Twain himself put it, and I quote, it usually takes me more than three weeks to prepare a good impromptu speech. Ladies and gentlemen from Argonne National Laboratory, Dr. Liz Laudadio. How long will you wear a pair of shoes before you realize it's time to get a new one? If you're like me, you will wear a pair of shoes until they essentially fall apart. This happened to me recently while I was out in my garden and realized I could literally feel the earth beneath my feet. Failure in this case. Failure of my shoes to continue doing their job, which is to contain my feet, is relatively benign. But what about systems with a lot more at stake? Where the consequences, when containment is no longer possible, are greater than just wet feet? In some cases, failure is not an option. One such case is with nuclear reactors. Nuclear energy will continue to be essential climate change, but nuclear reactors are not without areas for improvement. Safety and waste are two major concerns, especially to the public. The next generation of nuclear reactors address these two issues directly. Specifically, molten salt nuclear reactors handle these problems in such a way that they are safer, more efficient, and enable straightforward recycling of spent nuclear material back into usable fuel. So what's the catch, right? Well, molten salts, salts heated to the point they become liquid, are essentially like lava. And they can be highly damaging to the materials meant to contain them. If you're wondering, how do I know these things are going to be safe? Fear not. That's exactly what I'm working to ensure. Because with systems like these, failure is not an option. I'm creating coatings to protect the materials that make up molten salt nuclear reactors from corrosion. What comes to mind when you think of corrosion? Maybe the underside of your car or the pipes in your bathroom rusting. These things can be a pain to fix. They can be expensive. And sometimes you don't know there's a problem until it's too late. If we could stop corrosion, we can make things last longer. We could save money. We could prevent failure. You could think of corrosion as happening when the atoms in the material in contact with the molten salt choose to become part of the molten salt instead of stay in the material they're in. They do this when they think it's more favorable to become part of the molten salt. They're happier there. With the coatings I'm creating, their atoms in contact with the molten salt will say, no thanks, I'm happy right where I am. In this way, I am making corrosion unfavorable. There's a lot more work to be done, and while I personally may go through a few pairs of shoes in the years I study this problem, the goal is to have reliable, safe and sustainable nuclear energy, where failure is not a concern. Thank you, Liz. And I can so totally relate to what they said about shoes. You know, researchers love to learn, by themselves if necessary. In grad school, when he noticed that there was no course being offered on the topic, our next speaker taught himself lockpicking. Not that he ever did anything illegal with it, he says, but I refuse to believe that it's a coincidence he's been recruited to work on national security. Ladies and gentlemen from Lawrence Livermore National Lab, Dr. Brandon Zimmerman. When you're scooping ice cream that just came out of the freezer, do you use a plastic spoon? Of course not, unless you want a broken spoon. You understand that the loads placed on a structure determine what material has to be used. Material science research at Lawrence Livermore involves this same basic idea, 
but the materials that solve our problems don't exist yet. National security applications involve extreme high pressure loading conditions. And to safeguard our national interests, we need materials that not only survive, but can function under these loads. Imagine pressures several hundred thousand times greater than the atmospheric pressure you're feeling now, coming out of nowhere in just billionths of a second. These are pressure waves, like ocean waves, and they can destroy materials in unusual ways. To survive these loads, I needed to develop an entirely new type of material. So I turned to an entirely new manufacturing process. 3D printing of metals lets us create incredibly strong micro lattices that could never have been made before. Because these materials are mostly empty space, they can be as strong as steel and as light as plastic. And that's not all. The holes in these lattices should interact with those pressure waves. Think of the spreading, interfering pattern of ripples when you throw a handful of gravel into a pond. These interactions could help dissipate the energy of those waves. So let's test this idea. Lawrence Livermore has an advanced manufacturing lab that can print these lattices, and our lasers at the National Ignition Facility, or NIF, can replicate these extreme pressure conditions. The problem is, this testing is wildly expensive, so I can't just play with the laser all day. But I can use my computer and our world-class codes to simulate this testing. I use computational optimization to explore different lattice designs. I discovered these materials can work if you add a thin skin of solid material on top of the lattice to shield it from the worst of the pressure wave. This is an incredibly useful finding because by tuning the thickness of this sheet, I now have a new design variable I can manipulate for different environments. Running all these simulations saved a lot of taxpayer money because now I only have to test my final designs. I had titanium micro lattices printed on site and then I used the lasers at NIF to hit them as hard as I could. And they worked! One of my lattice designs withstood a pressure over a hundred times greater than you would experience at the bottom of the ocean's deepest trench. My research designed materials to operate under conditions that were previously impossible to survive. This drives home why fundamental research in material science matters, because our national security suffers if we don't have the materials to meet our nation's needs. I'm not working on ice cream scoops, but as Livermore scientists design the next generation of mission-critical machines for extreme environments, I've put a new material in their utensil drawer. I totally appreciate that you saved the taxpayer a lot of money. Now, beyond scientific discovery and national security, researchers at the DOE National Lab are also pursuing the technology to provide clean, abundant, cheap, and reliable sources of energy. Where so? Well, obviously at the National Energy Technology Laboratory, but also at Oak Ridge and Idaho National Laboratories, Berkeley Lab, and Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. By now, you know the drill. I'll be right back after these important messages. Video. Hello, my name is Brian Morielli, Associate Lab Director at the National Energy Technology Laboratory. My colleagues and I would like to wish Ashraf the best of luck today at the SLAM competition. Good luck. Hello, this is Congressman Chuck Fleischman, proudly representing Tennessee's 3rd Congressional District, wishing the best of luck to Dr. Janet Meyer from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Hi, this is Congressman Mike Simpson, proudly representing Idaho's 2nd Congressional District, wishing the best of luck to Kevin Vallejo from the Idaho National Laboratory. Hello, I'm Congresswoman Barbara Lee representing California's beautiful 12th Congressional District. I want to wish the best of luck to Dr. Ann Villacaston from <laughs> yeah. Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Hello, this is Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman, proudly representing New Jersey's 12th District, wishing the best of luck to Sung Mu Yang from the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory.
speaker in this category is once again a foreign national, but one that knows the United States well. He has already been visiting 34 US states, which I bet is more than the average US citizen in this congressional auditorium today. And I would argue that he demonstrated true research spirit when he said to me, only 16 more to go. Ladies and gentlemen from the National Energy Technology Laboratory, Dr. Ashraf Abedin. As most of you already know, the number one enemy for our environment is plastics. Unlike other wastes, plastics do not decompose, even in 500 years. And guess which country produces the most waste plastics in the world? The United States. An average American produces almost 300 pounds of plastic waste every year. That is a big number. Plastics are also responsible for greenhouse gas emissions, making it even worse for the environment. The concept of breaking down plastics and producing something as valuable as hydrogen fuel is really exciting because one, we are getting rid of this waste plastics, and two, we are producing hydrogen, which is known as one of the cleanest energy sources. Burning hydrogen produces just water as the end product. But when we burn fossil fuels, we are releasing harmful greenhouse gases like CO and CO2. People tried so hard to convert waste plastics into hydrogen using conventional technology. But unfortunately, it's a very high amount of energy consumption, which is super expensive and not very energy efficient. This is where our team comes in place. My colleagues and I at NETL are using microwave technology to convert waste plastics to hydrogen. As you know, plastics alone cannot be heated in microwave. If you put your plastic Tupperware in a microwave oven, all it heats up is the food inside and barely the box itself. Same thing happens when we put plastics in a microwave. Something needs to be added to it to heat it up. So we came up with this zero-value agricultural waste that can be used to absorb the microwave energy. Microwave heats it up first, which eventually heats up the plastics around it. So we are actually going carbon negative by using such renewable energy resources to convert our waste plastics. When we compared our microwave runs with a conventional technology, we found out that microwave does not only get rid of all these waste plastics, but it is also producing 40 times more hydrogen while consuming 10 times less energy. Just imagine, by simply switching the microwave on, we are getting rid of these waste plastics and producing hydrogen in one of the most energy efficient ways. Our goal is to design such microwave reactors that can be commercially available for governments and industry folks all around the world. And if we can do that, our clean energy future is in safe hands. Thank you, Ashraf. And you even though you probably own a microwave oven, do not try this at home, okay? <laughs> Promise. You know, researchers tend to be curious about nature. Our next speaker, for example, is also a bird watcher. Or you could say, yes, many people are. Well, perhaps, but how many people have done that in six different countries? Can you name the birds in Jamaica, for example? Well, she can. Oh, by the way, when she writes about a conductor, she does not mean the one that directs an orchestra, okay? We're talking about electrical conductors here. It's energy, remember? Ladies and gentlemen, and Congressman Fleischmann from Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Dr. Janet Meyer.
Recently, the White House announced the ambitious goal that by 2030, 50% of all new vehicles will be electric. This is a fantastic sustainability goal, but it faces some challenges. One of those challenges is the large amount of copper that's needed in the batteries, motors, and wiring of electric vehicles. In comparison to conventional gas car, a battery electric car has 10 times more copper. You might be thinking, what's wrong with copper? Well, copper is expensive, scarce, and heavy. Luckily, there's an alternative. Aluminum. Pure aluminum has a conductivity that is close to copper and is more widely abundant. It's also one-third the weight and one-third the price. But there is still a critical challenge. To replace copper, we need to match the strength and electrical conductivity requirements of the existing applications. To do this, we need to strengthen pure aluminum. The problem is, all the ways we strengthen metals tends to reduce their electrical conductivity. Solving this problem brings together my lab's strengths in using advanced microscopy and computational modeling for alloy design. We are currently working on an aluminum zirconium tin alloy that is really promising. It is known adding a small amount of copper to aluminum to form an alloy and holding it at high temperatures results in the formation of zirconium nanoparticles. These zirconium particles provide strengthening without reducing the electrical conductivity but they take a really long time to form. When we add a tiny amount of tin, the strength gets even better 10 times faster. So why does this happen and how can we use it? To answer this question, my team uses powerful electron microscopes to look at the nanometer scale. There, we are able to see columns of atoms, which gives us an understanding of how tin modifies the zirconium particles. We can even see where individual atoms are located using a special ion microscope. And for all the things we can't directly observe, we use computational models on our supercomputers to predict the atomic interactions between zirconium and tin. We have discovered that zirconium and tin atoms love to be near each other, and this results in the formation of more zirconium particles, which increases the strength faster. My role as a physical metallurgist is to connect what is happening on the nanometer scale to a scale a billion times larger in our electric vehicle. At this point, we have an alloy that is stronger than pure aluminum while maintaining its high electrical conductivity. We aren't quite at our strength target yet, but we now have a new tool to reach our goal. My research will help make electric vehicles more affordable, efficient, and lighter. So stay tuned to see where our work is going. Thank you, Janet. And I promise to donate to your research all of my used aluminum foil. Who says scientists cannot be artists? We've seen it. They can play music. They can dance. They can apparently spray paint. And they can write poetry. Even though his first language is Spanish, our next speaker has already published an anthology of poems in English and is working on a second one. If you're into poetry, check it out. Damas y caballeros, from Idaho National Laboratory, el Dr. Kevin Vallejo. These air conditioning units worked a lot harder this year, didn't they? The Antarctic sea ice extent, it's on a record low. And there are cities in Arizona that don't go below 90 degrees even at night for months at a time. It is clear our planet is facing a climate crisis due to our ever-increasing energy consumption. Preventing this crisis from becoming even worse requires us to get our energy from low or maybe even zero carbon emitting sources. Luckily, nuclear energy has emerged as a front runner solution to address this issue. To get this type of energy, we need efficient fuel sources. How would we go about making sure our country has a safe, reliable source of high quality nuclear fuel? 
There is amazing research happening out there right now. It uses industrial techniques to fabricate nuclear fuel in the form of pellets and tiny marbles that will power the nuclear reactors of the future. These nuclear reactors require a lot of things that we need to understand. Some of them are how the fuel will behave when in the, pressure, when in the presence of pressure, temperature, and water corrosion. To understand this, we need very complex mathematical models that in addition to that, need to account for impurity atoms and defects and impurities in just so many things. Wouldn't it be great to just grab the uranium atoms, put them in the right place with friendly neighbors and figure out how they want to behave? Wouldn't you feel more comfortable telling me your secrets if you were in your own home with the right people instead of being forced to be in a crowded room with people you don't like, this is where the Idaho National Laboratory research comes in. Using the vast lands of the state of Idaho, we design, test, and optimize the reactors of the future. My research uses molecular beam epitaxy. Essentially, the most expensive spray paint can that money can buy that ensures the safe travel and arrangement of the uranium atoms by controlling the surface temperature and the amount of atoms that arrive, I make sure that not only I'm producing thin films of supreme quality, as my team has already demonstrated with rare earths and transition metals, we are also delving into the universe's secrets. Understanding of the limits of matter and energy reside in the heaviest elements of the periodic table, of which uranium is a BIP member. With it, we are making sure that nuclear energy, when harnessed safely and effectively, can play the pivotal role it has in solving our climate crisis. Thank you, Kevin. Even the title of the 20 minute talk here has got a bit of a poetic vibe to it, wouldn't you say? Another speaker, another dancer. This one performed in hotels on the strip in Las Vegas. Not ballet, not burlesque either, no, Filipino folk dance. And to reveal the depth of my ignorance, I must confess that when I saw the title of a presentation for the first time, I actually believed that sorghum was the name of her husband. <laughs> My bad, it's a cereal. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, Dr. Anne Villacastin. But if you had a partner who was perfect for you in every way, except for one thing, they're too stubborn to accept any attempts to change for the better, would you give up on them or try to make it work? That's my dilemma with sorghum. Sorghum, or the king of millet, is the fifth most important cereal crop in the world. It's grown in over 30 countries and feeds half a billion people. But it's not just a food crop. It's also a powerhouse of bioenergy that can be grown in harsh conditions and produce more biomass than any other crop. Tapping into this abundant biomass and converting that into renewable biofuels, sorghum could be the green crop of the future. That solves our energy crisis. The catch, it's not easy to convert sorghum biomass into biofuels. Our solution, genetic transformation, a process where we introduce new genes into the plant to improve its traits. For example, we can introduce genes that would increase the digestibility of sorghum biomass. Genetically modified sorghum. Sounds easy, right? Mm, nothing is ever easy. You see, sorghum is notorious for being one of the most difficult crops to genetically transform. Growing sorghum in culture plates, 
in the laboratory is immensely labor intensive and requires the perfect combination of ideal plant tissue, light, nutrient, hormone. Oh, I could go on and on. But basically what I am saying is that sorghum is the bad boy of crop genetic transformation. It's hard to tame, unpredictable, and always a challenge. My goal is to improve sorghum transformation so we can maximize its potential as a bioenergy crop. To do this, I decided to borrow some wisdom from its more successful relative, wheat. Wheat has genes that make it easier to regenerate in the laboratory, so I thought maybe they could finally tame this bad boy. I introduced these genes using a soil bacterium through a natural infection process, and sorghum must be really liking these genes because I have seen an increase in the transformation efficiency of the crop. This new method opens possibilities for sorghum improvement. Imagine a genetically modified super sorghum, so efficient at providing us biofuels, it reduces our dependence on fossil fuels and mitigates climate change. I see sorghum as the bioenergy crop that could save our overheating planet. But with the challenges I face with genetic transformation, I could also see how this crop is so easy to love and just as easy to hate. So if you ask me about my current relationship with sorghum, yes, it's complicated, but don't worry, we are making it work. Thank you, Anne. And if you must know, her husband's name is Louis, okay? Now, as the Romans put it, mens sana in corpore sano, a healthy mind in a healthy body. If our next speaker is working on plasma physics, he must have a healthy mind. And if his friends are nicknaming him the Korean beast, it's because of his gym body. He can lift 250 pounds. Now, don't get your hopes up. He will be wearing a business suit just like the rest of us. Okay? Oh, and if you're not in the field, a tokamak is not a Native American weapon. Okay? It's a type of plasma reactor, fusion reactor. It's a magnetic confinement system for the plasma. From Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, Dr. Yang Song Mu. Imagine a broken dish. Broken dish is dangerous and difficult to use it again. We think that we should throw away. But look at this other dish. Isn't it beautiful? Surprisingly, this dish is made from the pieces of broken dish. And this technique is called Kinjiki art, and this restored dish becomes even more valuable than the original one. So this comes from the thinking outside the box. But I'm not here to talk about dishes today. Instead, I want to talk about clean, safe, and virtually limitless energy, which is fusion energy. But there are some instabilities that challenge the use of fusion energy. First, instability from high temperature. So to generate fusion energy, we need to have very high temperature, like the sun. And at this very high temperature, fusion energy becomes unstable very easily. Why? Imagine you are standing barefoot on a highway in the middle of summer in Florida. I bet you can't stay still even for a moment. And second, uh, instability from air fields. Now, look at the figure on the left. This is fusion reactor. And fusion reactor typically needs symmetric magnetic field, like this. But because of imperfection, we always end up having asymmetric magnetic field, like this. And this is error fields. And even with a tiny amount of error fields, fusion energy can become unstable and disruptive. So what, what should you do? Just eliminate these error fields? Instead, just like the Kinzuki art, I decide to think outside the box. I developed a technique to leverage air fields to control instability from high temperature. How? Look at the figure on the right. Do you see the lines surrounding the fusion reactor? 
These are the coils that can alter magnetic fields, and I use them to, to tailor the air fields. Now, look at the lines below. The first line is the case with air fields. So this line, shoo, psh, cut off early with a big spikes. This means no fusion energy. Now, look at the second line. This is the case without air fields. So now, line continues, but you still see a lot of spikes and wiggles. Don't you think that this line looks angry? We still can't use this energy. Finally, look at the third line. This is the case with tailored air field that I developed. And you can see there's a no drop, no big spikes. Finally, we can get stable fusion energy. So just like the Kenzuki art that turns broken dish into beautiful artwork, my work turns useless air, useless air field into useful stabilizing field for our sustain, sustainable future energy. Thank you. Thank you, Sung Moo. I don't know about you, but I will certainly feel a lot better the next time that I break a dish. At this point, I hope you are duly impressed with all that the national labs can do, but there is more. DOE researchers are also working on the technologies to tackle carbon emission and climate change, and they are addressing the difficult challenges of restoring Cold War legacy waste sites. Once again, how about a few words of encouragement from their sponsors? Hi, this is Congresswoman Brittany Pedersen. I proudly represent Colorado's 7th Congressional District, and I'm here today to wish Tiran Miller from the National Renewable Energy Lab the best of luck. Hello, this is Joe Wilson, member of Congress from the 2nd District of South Carolina. I'm grateful for the opportunity to represent the Savannah River National Laboratory, a critical contributor to the national security of the United States and an appreciated community partner to South Carolina and Georgia. Today, I am especially grateful to recognize Sean Noble. As a career researcher with the Savannah River National Laboratory, Sean was selected as the winner of the competition to represent the lab in the Best Speaker Award, contending against other national lab nominees from around the country. As the only member of Congress to have ever served at the Savannah River site myself, I know of its dedicated personnel. Congratulations, Sean. We wish you the best. I am proud today to recognize Mickey Rogers as this year's Pacific Northwest National Laboratory's SLAM participant. Mickey is a Linus Pauling Distinguished Postdoctoral Research Fellow at PNNL in the Environmental Molecular Sciences Laboratory. I'm wishing her the best of luck today representing the lab, which is the crown jewel of the Tri-Cities and the whole state of Washington. We're all rooting for you, Mickey. Hello, this is Adam Schwartz, director of Ames National Laboratory, wishing the best of luck to young Poo Jow from Ames National Lab. Good luck. You know, in local slams in the various national labs, speakers can usually pick an entrance song that was considered inappropriate for the Congressional Auditorium, I would have offered to sing myself, but um, nope, I cannot do that. In contrast, the next speaker, yes, she can. In fact, she's been recording songs in the very studio in which singer Jewel has been recording several of her albums. Ladies and gentlemen, from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, Dr. Taryn Miller. Do you guys know those people or have those friends that can literally turn what you'd throw away into something incredible? They work magic literally turning trash into treasure. They're not just crafting, they're recycling. In order to meet our environmental and energy goals, we need to rethink what we consider as waste, and we need innovative solutions to utilize it. 
at NREL, pe crafty people are constantly looking for new ways to recycle underutilized waste streams. Fortunately, nature's full of crafty organisms to get inspiration from, like the bacteria all around us, who have innovative solutions to use those hidden treasures, like landfilled plastic or lignin, a byproduct from plants, as food. In my group at NREL, we harness these bacteria to convert underutilized waste streams into renewable materials like bio-based plastics. There's a problem though. Some of the intermediate steps can be toxic for the cell and this limits the bioconversion. So how do we fix this? Well, again, nature offers us a solution. They actually, some bacteria can do it outside of the cell. They secrete these tiny vesicles called outer membrane vesicles, which are loaded with all sorts of macromolecules, like enzymes. <laughs> they serve as these little microreactors that can do all sorts of diverse functions. Importantly, they enable the cell to process waste outside of the cell. Taking advantage of this property, I want to use these little bubbles to solve big problems. I aim to repurpose these vesicles so that they can perform the toxic steps and increase the bioconversion of these wastes. Specifically, I want to redesign these vesicles so that they can aid in the processing of lignin, turn to turn it into flavors, fuels, or plastic. Basically, turning lignin into Legos. I'm currently testing genetic tools that will allow me to control their composition and creation. By targeting specific enzymes to these vesicles, I can alter their function and metabolism to aid in the processing of lignin. The biotechnological use of these vesicles to convert waste into value-added products allows me to play a part in helping NREL and the DOE achieve our nation's energy and environmental goals. If successful, this knowledge could be applied to reprogram these microfactories for all sorts of applications, from drug delivery and human health to environmental remediation and waste recycling. The best knowledge is often derived from simply understanding how a process works. If this process successfully aids bacteria, why can't we use it to achieve our goals? So let's use nature's strategies to improve waste recycling, achieve a circular bioeconomy, and create a more sustainable future. Let's get crafty and turn trash into treasure. Thank you, Terry. And I will certainly be looking at my trash bin differently from now on. That is for sure. You know, we've been hearing a few mind-boggling numbers today, but frankly, at a seconds, I can handle. What boggles my mind is a much smaller number. Our next speaker is the eldest of 11 children. That's an entire football team. I have boundless admiration for the parents. Ladies and gentlemen from Savannah River National Laboratory, Dr. Sean Noble. By a show of hands, who likes smoothies? Yeah, me too. I love, love a good strawberry mango smoothie. It's so good. My problem with smoothies, though, is that they're difficult to make. You add too much ice in it, it doesn't mix right, or you add too much liquid and it just turns out to be a cold juice. And then when you try to pour the smoothie out of the blender, it just kind of plops out and gets everywhere. It's just, it's difficult. The liquid waste at the Savannah River site, it's a lot like a smoothie. It's a thick slurry. Okay, it's a bit more dangerous than a smoothie <laughs> because it's radioactive liquid waste. Uh, so let's call it um, a danger smoothie. There are 35 million gallons of liquid waste stored at the Savannah River site in massive underground tanks. This waste is primarily a byproduct of the processing of nuclear materials for the national defense, dating back as far as World War II in the 1950s. 
The goal of the Savannah River site is to remediate this liquid waste to reduce the environmental impacts that it poses. While in a liquid form, this waste poses the threat of leaching into the environment and causing harm. So there is a need to change the waste from a liquid into a solid to make it much more stable to be stored long term. This is done through a process called vitrification, wherein the waste is transformed from a liquid into a glass and poured into canisters and stored underground. However, during this process, there arise many problems with the mixing and the transportation of this liquid waste that there's no quick or cost-effective method to address. But my research using advanced computer modeling is able to address these problems in a way that's cost-effective and quick. This is because the simulations can be done by a small team and their computers over the course of weeks or even days, depending on the complexity of the simulations. For example, there is a tank at the Savannah River site used to mix liquid waste with silica, a glass forming particle, in the preparation for the vitrification of that waste to turn it into glass. During the mixing, one of the mixing blades fell off and the quality of seven canisters of glass was in question. My team and I were able to perform simulations of the mixing vessel with the missing blade, and we were able to determine that the waste was indeed well mixed before being turned into glass, and that those seven canisters would meet the safety and quality standards that have been set. This results in a cost savings of around $12 million. Yeah, $12 million. So overall, my research increases safety, increases productivity, and it saves money. So the next time you want to make a smoothie, Try computer modeling. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Well, that talk made me hungry. <laughs> That's OK. Two more speakers. We're almost there. You know, some of us find our callings in life in unexpected ways. Our next speaker is not from the Pacific Northwest. She grew up in Ohio. That's far away from the oceans, but that's close enough to Lake Erie. And that's where she saw algae for the first time, and that ignited her current passion. Ladies and gentlemen from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, Dr. Mickey Rogers. <laughs> I'd like everyone to take a deep breath in and out. <sighs> Nothing like fresh air, right? I actually just flew straight here from a wedding in India in which the air quality wasn't so great. As an aerosol chemist, I was thinking about what am I breathing in? Now, I think about what's in the air a lot, actually. But normally I'm thinking about how the ocean acts as this giant can of spray paint emitting aerosol into our atmosphere. And in some of these aerosol, there are cells of algae. Now we know algal blooms exist in the water, and the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, monitors their toxin levels in the water. But when waves spray potentially toxic algae into the air, what are we breathing in? Well. We don't really know, but have no fear, the wrangler of these tiny airborne travelers is here. My laboratory-based research involves using a newly patented system to mimic ocean wave mechanics and spray algae. Once these algal cells are caught in our atmospheric chamber, we can manipulate the conditions and see how algae are changing, and this can tell us about human health. We want to know about human health results because we can supply these as inputs to atmospheric models so that we can have predictive, um, we can have predictive models to tell us about the health impacts from the algae. Uh, but not all algae is harmful, however. According to NOAA, the National Oceanic Administration and Atmospheric Administration, 98% of algae is non-harmful to humans. So why should we care about algae if it's in the air and it's not toxic? Well, these algal cells floating around in the atmosphere are acting as seeds in which clouds can grow from and acting as particles in which solar radiation can bounce off of. These tiny travelers are regulating the weather and climate of our entire planet 
and our new algae aerosolization system can help us understand just how effective they are at doing so. Learning about airborne algae, or as I like to call them, algosols, helps us accomplish two things. One, we can employ predictive models to forecast the spread of toxins in the air, empowering public health and policy decisions. Two, we can develop strategies to mitigate climate change and observe airborne algae's enhancement of these essential but natural climate processes. The more we learn about airborne algae, the urgency to monitor these tiny travelers becomes more clear with every breath that we take. Thank you, Mickey. Your talk was a breath of fresh air. Wouldn't you know it? Our last speaker is once again a musician. But no, he did not pack his instrument in his carry-on because he plays the piano. I asked him what kind of music, and without hesitation, he said to me, Johann Sebastian Bach. Ladies and gentlemen, last but not least, from Ames National Laboratory, Dr. Zhao Yunpu. When paper straw dissolves and ruins the taste of your drink, have you ever missed the old times when we can still use plastic straws? If your answer is yes, I'm sure you're not alone here. But have you also ever wondered why are we still transitioning from the plastic straws to paper straws? Well, it is because we choose to limit the consumption of single-use plastics to combat the plastic waste crisis and save our planet. What a noble goal. But is this the best way to do it? What if we have a smarter way to handle single-use plastics? Imagine if we have a catalyst that can facilitate the chemical reactions to effectively break down everyday plastic waste, such as water bottles, plastic straws, or shopping bags, and convert them into high-value functional materials, such as waxes, lubricants, or jet fuels. It can not only solve the plastic waste crisis, but also create new economic opportunity. So now, scientists at Ames National Lab are collaborating with other national labs and universities to bring this vision into reality. In the past, the challenge of achieving this is that we don't have a proper catalyst. The traditional catalyst produces a mixture of random chemicals, which is unsuitable for practical use. So to tackle this problem, our research team took inspiration from biology and designed a new catalyst with a unique core shell structure that can mimic the enzyme's mechanism to effectively and precisely break down everyday plastics. Thanks to the porous silica shell that can localize the polymer around the catalyst, our catalyst can now achieve a higher conversion, but at the same time, generate more unified products compared to the conventional catalyst. This is amazing progress. But to be honest, we still don't know everything about this catalyst, especially the reaction mechanism that contributes to such amazing activity. And this is the exact question that my research is trying to answer. I use magnetic resonance to probe the atomic scale interactions between the polymer and the catalyst. By analyzing the reactions using, ca using catalysts with different parameters, I can further review the correlation between the structure and the surface interactions. With these insights, our team can further optimize the structure and the composition of the catalyst to achieve a higher conversion with lower energy input, and more importantly, to tune the chemical properties of the products for different applications. As of today, we have successfully demonstrated the feasibility of transforming this technology from lab trial to larger scale applications. We are creating a cleaner future where the single-use plastics will no longer be an environmental burden, so hopefully, one day in the near future, we can proudly bring plastic straws back into our lives. Thank you, Yunpu. I want to save the environment. I really do. But I, too, would welcome back the plastic straw. Could I have the 17 finalists on stage one last time, if you please? 
these young people You, you have no idea how many versions of their stories and slides they went through, how many rehearsals, but especially they had the guts to expose themselves to the judgment of such a critical audiences as yourselves. They deserve a big applause again. Thank you, finalists. I will see you outside in just a moment. But in the meantime, a few more thanks are in order. Yes, I will see you outside in a moment. <laughs> Was that not clear? You got it, right? <laughs> Before I join them, a few more thanks are in order. Of course, this event would not have been possible without the generous support of our sponsors. <laughs> And without the countless hours of work for so, from so many staff members at all 17 national labs. I cannot mention them all, but I would like to thank in particular the two individuals who have been carrying this project, this dream, on their shoulders from day one. From Lawrence Berkeley and Lawrence Livermore, Meg Rodriguez and Christine Zacco. Oh. Come on, Meg Rodriguez, Christine Zacco. <laughs> All right, I'm almost done, but you are not. Audience members near and far, Please vote now for the People's Choice Award by either scanning this QR code or going to this short URL there on the left. You've got 10 minutes to do so. And after that, for those of you who are in person today in Washington, and only after you have voted, I will invite you to join me in the atrium for the reception. And after a little while, obviously, to announce the winners. For our remote attendees, the winners will be posted on the website of this event and on X at Energy. Thank you so much for joining us today in Washington DC for the first ever national slam. I will see you outside.